Hello, I am Christian Stevenson with the Mississippi State University Extension Service in Hancock County. Uh, welcome to another of the Zoom presentations on horticulture and gardening. Uh, if you are here, uh, welcome to the uh, to the presentation. Um, and the um, if you're watching on YouTube, I really appreciate you joining us. Uh, and I would remind you, if you have any questions and you are watching the recording of this, uh, you can put the put a question down in the comment section. I get a notification when somebody makes a comment. Uh, so if it's a question, I'll be happy to come and, uh, and contact you privately or uh, just respond in the comment section there in the YouTube group. Um, and I'd also uh, request, if you would like to, uh, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Uh, and that will let you know uh, when I post a, uh, a new video, uh, which uh, should be uh, you know, once or twice a week. So uh, be uh, useful to, to keep you updated uh, about what, you know, about the new presentations that are coming up. So today I'm going to be talking about beneficial insects, particularly for home gardens. Uh, and along the way, I am going to mention some other things that are kind of involved in the idea of biological control. Uh, and biological control is really just using uh, living things to assist in managing some of the pests that we can deal with in our gardens uh, or more broadly in agricultural production. Uh, so when we talk about beneficial insects in home gardens, we're really generally going to be talking about three different things. Uh, the first of those are going to be predators uh, of the insect pests that we're dealing with. So uh, the classic example is the lady beetle. Uh, it's a really good kind of charismatic insect that, uh, that people can see. Uh, looks really friendly, but is a, does a really good job uh, of doing things like feeding on aphids and reducing those populations. Uh, a little bit uh, uh, sort of a, you know, less well-known are is a type of insect called a parasitoid. Uh, and parasitoid is kind of like a parasite, um, but a parasitoid, instead of living inside the, uh, uh, the organism, will actually lay eggs generally in uh, whatever uh, target pest there is those eggs will develop inside of that other organism and, um, and help control the, the pest insects that way. Uh, and we talk about beneficial insects. I, I think it's also important for us to look at the other side of it uh, because pollinators are really important as beneficial insects in our gardens and landscapes as well. Um, so uh, in addition to helping us deal with pests, we also have uh, these insects uh, that help with pollination, uh, that for our gardens help them be more productive. Uh, and so we'll talk about you know, butterflies and moths and bees as well. Uh, so uh, what I uh, really like to focus on when I talk about beneficial insects is how we can bring them into our landscapes. Uh, and the best way to do that, just like we, you know, just like any time when we talk about bringing wildlife of any sort into the landscape, the best thing to do is to provide them with the habitat that they need. Um, for us as gardeners, what that generally is going to mean is we need to provide plants that are going to favor those populations. Uh, so having uh, flowers that are in and associated with our vegetable gardens, uh, are going to provide really good living space. It's going to provide food for pollinators as well as for predators. Uh, one thing that's particularly interesting, especially with insects like the parasitoids, uh, oftentimes while they, they may be helping control the pest, usually that might be the immature, uh, but the adult may be nectar feeding as opposed to, uh, to the immature feeding on, uh, on insect pests. So uh, having those flowers there provides them habitat, provides them with a food source, so it can be really beneficial in drawing those populations in and maintaining them in the home landscape. Uh, now another thing that we want to pay attention to is when we apply insecticides, we do want to, uh, to pay attention to the fact that insecticides, while they are an extraordinarily useful and important tool, 
in managing insect pests, uh, they can have off-target activity. So uh, they can, while they're controlling the pest, also damage the populations of uh, the insects or mites or other organisms that, that are actually doing us a favor there in the landscape. So we want to limit insecticide applications to only when they're necessary uh, to help protect those populations. Uh, now we also want to provide a water source uh, for insects like butterflies. Uh, you can see the picture there of a butterfly uh, you know, drinking water on a stone. Um, just like us, they, they do need water. Uh, so having a, a, you know, an area where th there's going to be a little bit of water available for them uh, can be very beneficial. And I think later in the presentation, I have an image of a few ways that you can approach that. Uh, so uh, just to mention this again, uh, you know, people are, uh, uh, you can kind of have two different approaches to, uh, to using insecticides. Uh, and at either extreme, I think we wind up with problem. If you just spray all the time uh, without knowing that you have any, anything there that you're spraying for, uh, it can cause you know, a lot of problems and getting rid of beneficial insects. That's not something we want to do. Uh, at the same time, insecticides are very important in controlling those insect pests. Uh, and uh, we are going to need to use an insecticide of some sort to protect the plants in our gardens. Uh, so there is a, a place in the middle that we can occupy uh, where we're only applying insecticides when it's necessary to do that, when there's a population of pests there uh, that is big enough and causing enough, uh, enough damage that it's important that we control it. The other thing we can do is make sure that we're choosing an insecticide that is going to be as targeted as possible. Uh, so a really good example of that, uh, you see there in the image, that's an insecticide called thuricide. Um, it's derived from a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis. We'll talk a little bit more about that later also. Uh, but that particular version of, uh, of what we call BT, uh, which is just an abbreviation for Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, really only affects caterpillars. So if we have a caterpillar pest in the garden, we can apply this insecticide without having to worry about whether we're damaging other insect populations. Uh, now, of course, that doesn't work for, uh, for, in, for problems like stink bugs and things like that. Uh, we just want to be as targeted as we can, uh, pay attention to you know, whether we really need uh, a long residual insecticide, things like that. Uh, so you just want to use the, the best tool, most specific tool for the particular job you're trying to get it to do. Uh, now, uh, one thing that I am particularly interested in uh, is growing, ho growing host plants uh, that support populations of beneficial insects. And a lot of times we can kind of consider this an aspect of what we call conservation biological control. Uh, so what we're doing is we're, we're keeping that habitat for those beneficial insects around the area. And so we're conserving those populations of beneficials so that they can then move into the area of our garden uh, and help us with managing some of those in insect pests. So some things that we want to do, we want to make sure we grow a diversity of plants. Uh, monoculture tends to uh, you know, support the populations of insects that can be damaging to the one plant that we're growing. Uh, so having a wider diversity of plants, you know, incorporating flowers into our vegetable gardens, having a range of different flowers uh, around where we're growing our ornamentals can be really beneficial in maintaining those insect populations that we want to keep. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the, the predator or parasitoid insects uh, actually feed on nectar in their adult stage. So having those flowers uh, that not only may attract different species, but bloom at different times uh, can help support those populations. Uh, and just, you know, avoid anything that is going to be a, an attractant uh, to a, a major pest for the thing that you're growing. And, and an example I always think of this is sunflower uh, is, is a really attractive crop to uh, to leaf-footed bugs and stink bugs. Uh, they really like sunflowers. So 
uh, you can you know plant sunflower, and, and certainly there are beneficial insects that are associated with it as well. Um, but you want to be cautious about that if you're going to allow that population to develop on the sunflower. You really need to treat uh, those sunflower for those insects. Otherwise, you kind of have a problem where they they get uh, they run out of sunflower and then they move on to the uh, to the other crop that you're growing. Uh, one way that we can do this is the incorporation of what's called nursery strips into our uh, into our production area or the area where we're growing our garden. Uh, and that's just planted with a variety of flowers that, that bloom at different times. And that provides habitat for uh, habitat and nectar sources for beneficial insects. Uh, we're actually currently doing a project that's looking at the use of cut flowers uh, as a nursery shrimp and vegetable production. Uh, so I'm really interested in how that's going to turn out. Uh, and if we can demonstrate not only uh, that we can you know, uh, have those, those flowers in there that are uh, you know, then able to uh, support beneficial insect populations that'll get onto the, you know, that'll move on to vegetable plants, um, but also have a, a product that's a saleable product for a producer uh, or at least a, an enjoyable thing to have in the garden for a home, uh, for a home gardener. Now, occasionally I, I, I see ads for purchasing beneficial insects. Uh, I, I've seen advertisements for lady beetles, uh, probably most commonly, uh, but I also see advertisements for, uh, for other kinds of uh, biological control insects uh, you know, praying mantis uh, egg sacs and you know, egg cases rather and, and things like that. Uh, and if you have an enclosed environment like a greenhouse, that can work very well. So, you, you know, you kind of have the, uh, uh, the predator in there kind of uh, trapped in that environment uh, with only, you know, the only thing that's in there that's an option for it to eat is the pest you're trying to get rid of. So that can be very effective. Uh, when we try to transfer that outdoors, uh, that, that can be really complicated. And I've, I've seen this done a number of times. Uh, you know, people ordering 50,000 lady beetles, they come in a nice little box, they're all alive. Uh, and the person goes out to their, their small home garden, they order, the, you know, they, they open up this box, uh, and there are just lady beetles everywhere uh, that day. But the population of lady beetles really declines very quickly. Uh, because there's just not enough habitat and enough food source for all of those lady beetles. Uh, so I really think in, a, in an outdoor environment, uh, unless you have some way to support that population uh, of beneficial insects, really the best thing to do is to provide a habitat for them. Let them, you know, let them come to that habitat uh, rather than trying to do these releases in, in kind of a, in an open environment. Uh, so, you know, oftentimes you just kind of see the, the, the box open up and the lady beetles come out uh, and really as, as soon as they're out, they start flying off and dispersing out into the landscape, uh, off into your neighbor's property and, and further on. Uh, now there are ways to uh, also kind of encourage uh, the uh, uh, the presence of beneficial insects, and there's an idea called banker plants. Uh, and we've, we've discussed this before, banker plants promote the population of a pest that isn't the pest that you're worried about. So uh, some good examples of that are crepe myrtle aphids. So crepe myrtle aphids are pretty specific about just getting on crepe myrtles. Uh, and sometimes, you know, they're the problem, uh, but in some instances, the crepe myrtle aphids aren't really a big issue, and they really support the populations of some beneficial insects, like lady beetles. Uh, you can see lady beetle larvae up in, in that top picture uh, feeding on those aphids. Uh, so having the crepe myrtles there right by the, uh, uh, by the garden can kind of provide a way for you to support the populations of those beneficial insects that will then spread on to your other plants. Uh, another really classic example 
uh, is the use of barley and another aphid called the, the uh, bird cherry oat aphid. Uh, bird cherry oat aphids are really specific to just grow, just living on these grasses. Uh, so they get on barley and oats and wheat and things like that, but they don't transfer onto the broadleaf plants that we normally grow. So uh, you can have the, the barley uh, oat aphid there uh, or the bird cherry oat aphid there. It can support populations of beneficial insects that again move off into your uh, landscape. Uh, not one I've seen in person, uh, but papaya can also be used to support white flies and, and then support the, uh, the beneficial insects. Apparently the papaya is very attractive to white flies, uh, so you can support those beneficial insects. And you can see a picture down on the bottom of papaya growing in the middle of a tomato greenhouse to support those, uh, those insects, those beneficial insects, to keep the white flies off of the tomatoes. Uh, now, one thing that, you know, we, we kind of keep in mind, you know, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, you know, while beneficial insects can be great and, and help reduce our population of pests, what we really want to think about is the population of those pests and how damaging that is to the plant that we're, we're talking about. Uh, and entomologists doing a lot of research kind of, you know, kind of came up with this idea of what's called the economic injury level. Uh, and that applies very well to agronomic crops or to horticulture crops, uh, where we have a yield where we can kind of we can take away from that uh, a, a value of the yield and, and the value of the damage that's being done. With ornamental plants, it's a little bit more difficult to come up with a an injury level, uh, so we refer to an aesthetic injury level. Are they damaging the appearance of the plants? And the goal then is to keep the population of the pest insect below a threshold where they cause that damage. And below that, we have a, an economic threshold or an aesthetic threshold, which is the level where we want to provide a treatment in order to have that control. And the, the goal of using beneficial insects and other cultural controls is just to keep that population of the pest insects below that threshold as much as we possibly can. But I think it's also important to recognize that if that population does get above the threshold, that's the time when we need to step in and, and maybe use those insecticidal controls as well. Uh, so I wanna talk about some of the common uh, beneficial insects that we might see in the home landscape. I uh, already mentioned this one. It's probably the most famous beneficial insect. It's the one we all think about, and that's the lady beetle. Uh, lady beetles are, uh, are beetles. They're in the family Chrysomelidae. Um, have a really distinct, distinctive shape, uh, kind of a round appearance. Uh, often they'll be red with spots. They, they may not have spots. They're, they're, there's a lot of variation in appearance. They all do have that rounded uh, you know, shape of the adult. Uh, the immature looks very, very different. You can see the immature picture there in the, the bottom picture. Uh, and it has that long appearance. Uh, the way that it was described to me, they, they called it alligator shaped. I don't know if I buy that. I've seen a fair few alligators. Uh, but uh, very active, soft bodied. Uh, usually dark color with yellow or red or orange purple markings, uh, but they are very effective predators of aphids and white flies, several other insects, uh, very heavy feeders. They do feed preferentially on aphids, but also feed on caterpillar eggs, uh, as well as mites and white flies. Uh, so, a uh, very great, a very good beneficial insect to have around. One of the things we can do to support their population is again, to plant things that will favor those insects. Uh, some plants that work really well for that, uh, dill and cilantro and fennel, uh, tansy, yarrow, uh, butterfly plant, which you know everyone should have around anyway. Uh, one of the things you'll notice when we talk about flower, these plants that favor beneficial insects, there, there's two things uh, that really leap out at me 
when I consider the, the appearance of the plants or, or what plants we're talking about, uh, one of those is the plants tend to have the, the groups of flowers. Uh, so large numbers and groups of flowers uh, would be a, a quality of those plants that I would pick out as being very common. The other thing that I like to, to point out is that, you know, as we look at these different plants, a lot of them uh, tend to show up in our herb garden. So having a really nice herb garden uh, there around your vegetable garden or other, uh, you know, other gardens that you may have uh, is really beneficial in supporting those populations of beneficial insects. Uh, a, uh, another insect that is a, a common, uh, you know, one that commonly occurs uh, in our own landscapes are lace wings. There are two different lace wings that we commonly run into. The green lace wing, which you can see a picture of in the, uh, in the, at the bottom there, uh, and the brown lace wing, which looks very similar. It's, it's just brown. Uh, uh, the green lace wings uh, and, and brown lace wings both kind of slender insects, really long wings, uh, transparent, kind of finely veined. Uh, the, the, uh, the larvae look fairly similar to those of the, the lady beetle. Uh, you can see one of those feeding on a caterpillar up in that top image. Uh, and I always, uh, they're in the same group as antlions. Uh, and I always think, uh, you know, when I was a kid, you'd see the little, uh, divots in the ground with the antlion down at the bottom and I take a little piece of straw trying to, to catch the antlion, uh, but very similar and, uh, and very effective predators uh, of a, a range of different insects. Uh, feed again on aphids and white flies, but they'll also eat uh, moth eggs uh, as well as uh, small caterpillars. Uh, and here is an image of the brown lacewing. Again, you can see it looks very similar. Uh, just uh, just brown as opposed to green. The uh, the green lacewing uh, adults are, are are nectar feeders. Uh, brown lacewing adults uh, will feed on uh, on aphids and white flies as well. They they remain uh, predators even in their adult stage. Uh, and lacewings are again you know as I've mentioned just uh, prolific predators. Uh, they will devour a, a large number of prey in a very short amount of time. Uh, they, they did a test of this. Uh, they you know, releasing lace wings with a, into an area and found that they ate 75% of the prey that was there within just 48 hours. Uh, so they can uh, consume a large number of pest insects very quickly. And you can kind of see the, the same qualities uh, in, the, in these plants, for the most part, uh, Angelica, Caraway, Queen Anne's Lace, uh, Dandelion, uh, which, you know, everybody, you know, I, I often have people ask me how to get rid of dandelion in yards. Uh, and uh, while I, I do tell them how to do that, uh, it's a plant that I actually like having around. Uh, another really good example of a, a plant that, that works really well to support beneficials our, our sunflower, so prairie sunflower is a really good example there also. Uh, another insect, uh, one that, that can be a little bit confusing is the searfid fly, uh, often called hover flies, um, because they tend to hover around flowers, uh, but also called bee flies because their coloring uh, makes them very easy to confuse with bees. Uh, they tend to have a uh, yellow uh, coloration with black lines. Uh, and if you don't look very closely at their eyes or at, or at the fact that they only have that one pair of wings as opposed to two, it's really easy to mistake them for bees. Uh, they're not, the, the adults are, uh, are, are completely harmless uh, and will often uh, uh, be around flowers just feeding on the flowers. Uh, it's the immature stage that is particularly beneficial. Um, the, the immature uh, searfid fly, uh, which for flies it is called a maggot, um, it, as much as that is often a, a distasteful term, uh, but you can see it feeding on aphids uh, in that top picture. Uh, so very effective at, uh, at reducing those uh, aphid populations. Uh, and again, 
uh, you know, some plants that we might see in an herb garden. So lavender and spearmint, uh, lavender globe lily, uh, or wild bergamot, uh, purple poppy mallow, uh, great plants to have in the home landscape in their own right, but also really supportive of, uh, of uh, syrupid flies. Uh, mint is uh, just a great thing to add in around the border of a garden or in the middle of your garden. Uh, for one thing, if you plant it, you'll never have to plant it again. It just spreads prolifically. Uh, so uh, really easy to share out, uh, but also really supports these beneficial insects. Uh, one of the ones that I consider really interesting are the parasitic wasps. Uh, there are several different groups of these uh, that, that range fairly dramatically in size. Uh, the largest one uh, that we tend to run into are the, the ichneumonid wasps. Uh, and the, the reddish wasp that you see with the caterpillar in the, the top right uh, is in that, that group, the ichneumonidae. Um, they, they can also be, be uh, very, you know, very small. You can see a picture of another parasitic wasp uh, there with some, uh, some insect eggs. Uh, and what they do is they lay their eggs uh, into the body of another insect. Uh, those eggs hatch out, the larvae develop inside the other insect, uh, and as they're doing that, of course, they, they, uh, they bring about the end of their, uh, of their host. Uh, and you can see a picture down in the bottom there. Uh, that is a uh, tomato hornworm uh, with just masses of pupae attached to it. Uh, that's all of those uh, little wasp larvae that have lived inside of it, have come out and, have pu uh, and are pupating. Uh, to then uh, you know, turn into the adult wasp and, and fly off and repeat the process. Uh, so they can be very effective, not only at attacking caterpillars, uh, but you also have parasitoids that, that will uh, lay their eggs inside the eggs of, uh, of other insects like stink bugs or, or some of the, uh, the caterpillars. Uh, also notable, uh, as I've mentioned, in most cases, these parasitic wasps in their adult stages are nectar feeders. Uh, so really important that we keep those uh, flowers around to provide the adults with that food source. So uh, cosmos and tansy, uh, crimson thyme, are really attractive lemon balm, parsley. Again, uh, some great plants to have in our herb garden uh, as well as there to promote beneficial insects. Uh, there is a, a great diversity of predatory bugs, and, and I am by no stretch of the imagination uh, providing an exhaustive list because there's just a really long list of these uh, predatory bugs. Uh, one that we, we commonly think of are assassin bugs. Uh, another one that we, we would commonly see are wheel bugs. Uh, wheel bugs are really distinctive and easy to pick out because they have that, you can... Uh, See the, the bottom picture there, they have that sort of wheel or gear shape on the back of their thorax uh, that just makes them really easy to identify. Um, they do commonly attack caterpillars, they'll attack other insects as well. Uh, they have a, a, a mouth part that is kind of like we would expect for a stink bug or for a mosquito where they stab that into uh, the, their, uh, their prey. Uh, and, uh, and are very effective at that. Uh, there are other predatory bugs, things like the big-eyed bugs, uh, just a range of others. Uh, we don't tend to see these in very large numbers, uh, but they are important predators uh, and, uh, and can be very effective at, at reducing pest populations. Uh, so uh, really interesting insects. One question that I frequently get uh, is, is people being confused about uh, whether they have assassin bugs or whether they have leaf-footed bugs, because the immature leaf-footed bugs uh, have kind of a red color, uh, and uh, we, com we commonly do see them on garden plants. Uh, so there's a, a fairly simple way to figure out which of the two you have. The, the first, um, is that, um, you know, generally speaking, when we, when we think of a predator, 
uh, predators tend to operate alone. You don't tend to see them in large groups. Leaf-footed bugs, particularly immatures, tend to aggregate together. Um, so uh, if you see a large number of them, or if you see a, a group of them all hanging out together on your fruit, uh, then uh, what you have almost certainly are leaf-footed bugs uh, as opposed to the, uh, to the assassin bug. Uh, and I saw a question there in the chat area uh, there, is an other in, there is another insect called the kissing bug, uh, triatoma, uh, not specific, I'm, I am uh, forgetting the uh, specific epithet there, um, but the kissing bug is an important vector of a, a human disease uh, called Chagas disease, uh, and it is in the same group um, as the as the assassin bug, so it's in the the insect family Regiviidae, uh, but not not one you're going to find in your garden, uh, and hopefully you don't find it in your house either. Uh, and the, your regular assassin bug is, is not going to be a problem uh, for for transmitting or, or even biting you or anything like that. Uh, but there it just happens to be in the same family as that particular beneficial insect. Uh, so, not insects. Uh, always, uh, always have to call that out. Spiders have too many legs. Um, all insects have the have six walking legs. Uh, of course, spiders have eight. Uh, but spiders are beneficial arthropods uh, that we can commonly find in our garden. Um, the the majority of spiders uh, do make webs. Uh, we'll often see uh, garden spiders. Uh, kind of like the, the one that you see there in the bottom image making webs. Uh, I commonly find them uh, in, between my, uh, in between my tomato plants, uh, and they will catch flying insects uh, that are moving around the garden. They can be really beneficial because of that. Um, there are a lot of spiders as well that are hunting spiders, uh, like the wolf spiders, uh, that rather than making webs that will uh, will move around and, and actively hunt. Uh, one of the ones that we very often see in gardens is the green lynx spider. You can see a picture of that up in the top. Uh, very distinctive, bright green color with those black spines on its legs. Uh, but a uh, very important predator that we have in gardens. So if you see them, uh, don't be worried about them. They're absolutely harmless to people. Uh, but they are very, very aggressive predators of caterpillars, other insects that could be damaging in your garden. Uh, so they're doing you a favor by being there. Uh, now, predatory mites might not be one that you see. Uh, predatory mites are feeding on the populations of mites like two-spotted uh, two spider mites uh, or broad mites, other mites that we might have in our landscape. Uh, and they ha really help keep those populations down. Uh, and there are, uh, there are predatory mites that you can release out into your landscape as a control for some of those mite populations. Uh, one of the reasons why we might have a mite problem is after we apply an insecticide, that insecticide can have negative impacts on these populations of predatory mites that allow that this, the flush of, of the damaging mites to appear. Uh, so uh, you may not see them because they are very small. Uh, they do have kind of a distinctive appearance, kind of pear-shaped, uh, really long, uh, long legs. Uh, and we can support them by making sure we have naturalized areas bordering the garden. Uh, that will serve as a reservoir for them so they can colonize the garden plants later even if we do have to apply an insecticide. Uh, getting, a, getting further afield in terms of the beneficial organisms that we can talk about, uh, parasitic nematodes. Normally when I am talking about nematodes, uh, I am talking about them uh, being a problem for our plants. Uh, the one that, that we tend to be most familiar with uh, is root knot nematode, which causes those knot, sort of uh, galls 
uh, or knots on the root system of the plants that we uh, that we like. Uh, but there are a, a number of species of uh, nematodes that are uh, parasitic on insects, particularly insects that are in the ground. Uh, the, they do occur naturally in the soil. Uh, occasionally they are released, particularly for container nursery production, they can be released uh, as a treatment for uh, beetle grubs and other insects. Uh, they've also been used to help control wood boring beetles in uh, plants like dogwood and sycamore. Uh, and when you when you purchase parasitic nematodes, they, they come in a uh, uh, essentially a soil product or a, a, a sandy type material uh, that's distributed over the area where you're applying them. Um, you, you can't see the nematodes because they're they're just very, very, very small. Um, they get down into the soil and they go after the insects in there. You can see a picture of a grub uh, that has been parasitized down in that bottom image. Not the most pleasant thing in the world to look at, uh, but very effective at controlling some of those populations. Uh, even further afield are beneficial pathogens. Uh, so these are uh, fungi and bacteria and viruses that can help control insects. A uh, really common one for fungi is Bouveria bassiana. Uh, it's used to help manage beetles and ants and true bugs. Uh, and you can see a picture that I, I uh, shamelessly stole up in the, uh, uh, the top image there of a, a caterpillar that's been affected by Bouveria bassiana. You can see that white growth on the outside of the insect uh, is the growth of that fungus that has, has killed it off. Uh, now, I didn't put up a picture uh, for uh, the bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, I mentioned it earlier. It is probably the most common biological control applied uh, over the, the widest range of things. It's very specific. The one that we normally apply or think of applying is very specific to caterpillars. Uh, that's Bacillus thuringiensis kurtoski. Uh, there is additionally a Bacillus thuringiensis israelensis, uh, which is used for the control of fly larvae. So it's often used in mosquito abatement programs, things like that. It's also used for control of fungus gnats uh, in ornamental nursery production, a range of other things. Uh, there's another uh, version, I, I forget the, the subspecies for this one, but th it's used in management of some beetle pests. Uh, but they're very specific, very targeted, and that allows us to use them uh, to control that specific pest without potentially damaging any other populations. Uh, there are even viruses that can be used as a control for insects, uh, particularly in caterpillars. There's a group of viruses called the nuclear polyhedrosis viruses. We normally abbreviate that to NBV because it's a lot easier to say. Uh, and of course, it affects caterpillars. Uh, and uh, they, they eat the particle of the virus and it, it will, uh, will kill them off. And you can see a picture of a caterpillar uh, that's been affected by that virus down there in that bottom image. Uh, so uh, there's a wide range of things out there that can be used as not only beneficial insects, uh, but other organisms that can be important in biological control. Uh, moving on to the, the pollinators that can uh, be uh, equally, if not more important than the other kinds of beneficial insects, uh, butterflies and skippers, uh, we all enjoy having them in our home landscapes. Uh, we do like to draw them in and you know, having the right plants to draw them in can be really important. Uh, so you know, having large swaths of color, uh, you know, the, the butterflies and skippers are going to be attracted to the color of those flowers. So having just big swaths of that color is really going to help draw them in. Uh, and of course, we do want to use insecticides sparingly because we don't want to have any damage to the butterflies uh, or to the caterpillars that they will, that will later turn into. Uh, we do want to make sure that we have, uh, have habitat for caterpillars and for adults. Uh, we want to have a sunny area where they can, uh, where they can warm up in the morning. Uh, butterflies, like all insects, are, are cold-blooded, uh, so they need to get out there in the sun and, and gather some of that heat 
Uh, you'll often see them at a, in a sunny pike, start in a sunny area, kind of moving their wings back and forth uh, to get their uh, what we call hemolymph uh, rather than blood moving through their body to warm them up. Uh, they like to hide under shrubs at night. Uh, you can also use a small wood pile, uh, about three to five foot, uh, to give them a shelter area. Uh, give them a nice mud puddle to, uh, to get where they can get water and minerals uh, or some flat stones where they can uh, just either get water because the, the water will stay on that flat stone or just use that area to warm up and that'll provide really good habitat for butterflies. Uh, some plants that work really well, uh, you know, just kind of a, uh, you know, some good ideas for what's going to draw those butterflies in. Zinnias, uh, Joe pie weed is uh, really effective. Uh, all of the milkweeds, of course, for the monarch butterflies. Uh, Leotris uh, is, is great. Parsley, again, uh, if you have an herb garden, uh, you'll find those caterpillars there in that herb garden fairly quickly. Uh, so again, some plants that work really well for butterfly larvae. Uh, milkweed for your monarchs, dill uh, for your caterpillars, as well as making a, an excellent tzatziki sauce. Uh, parsley, uh, anise. Uh, hollyhock all, all work really well for butterfly larvae. Uh, and again, just you know, keep in mind having those large swaths of color, uh, using your in insecticide sparingly. Uh, you can see the image there where you have those plants grouped together to be really attractive and, and really catch the eye of the insects as they fly by. Uh, so wildflowers that work really well for attracting the adults. Uh, of course, uh, coneflower, uh, echinacea, the purple coneflower works fantastic. Uh, lantana, uh, all of the asters, Joe pie weed again, uh, and spearmint, all very attractive to butterflies and, and wonderful additions to the home landscape uh, that will keep these insects you know, there and coming back. Uh, just keep in mind, you provide them shelter. Uh, you can see an image there of, of some butterflies uh, grouped around an area kind of on the ground uh, and drawing up that water and mineral uh, so that they can uh, get all their needs and then some rocks to, uh, to warm up uh, is going to take care of everything that they need. Uh, of course, the other big, uh, big uh, pollinator that we want to talk about are bees. Uh, plants around your gardens can be used to attract them, uh, very commonly attracted to wildflowers. Uh, Probably the easiest plant to attract bees is clover. Uh, very easy to, uh, to distribute, very easy to allow it to grow. Uh, and again, you know, avoid the overuse of insecticides because bees can be damaged by those uh, chemicals as well. Uh, now, the bee everyone thinks of is the European honeybee, which is very important for uh, agriculture. Um, it's one of the, the few ways that we can actually positively increase rather than just protect uh, the, the productivity of plants is by having bees. Uh, so very effective. Uh, of course, they're, they're not negative to here in North America. They are the European honeybee. Um, but they've been here for, uh, for as long as we, uh, as long as Europeans have. Uh, and uh, are very important as pollinators. We do have a number of native species of bees uh, that are as much or more important uh, than the honeybee. Uh, bumblebees uh, are a, a good example of that. There are several, there are uh, 12 species here in Mississippi. Uh, so you may see different kinds of bumblebees around your garden. Uh, and they construct nests in the ground, sometimes in abandoned buildings. Their nests are much smaller uh, than those for what we would think of for a honeybee. They generally only have you know, three or four hundred bumblebees in a nest, uh, and they only use those nests for a single year. Uh, I got several calls over the course of this past year, you know, asking about bumblebees nesting in an area, uh, and really the, the best thing we can do sometimes is just be patient with them. They're not going to come back and use that nest again the next year, so we want to protect their population, just be patient with them and let them move, uh, move off uh, when they're done with that area. Um, they, they feed on pollen, they collect it in pockets on their hind legs. You can see that up in that top image. Uh, and they do this really interesting thing where they'll land on the flower and they kind of, uh, they sonicate or they, 
uh, make, some, make some noise and that kind of shakes the pollen around and makes them really effective pollinators. Uh, mason bees are, are my favorite bee. They're uh, really interesting. They're uh, solitary bees that build their nests in hollow twigs, uh, holes that are made by wood boring bees, uh, have uh, just a copious amount of, of hairs on their body that make them really effective uh, at pollinating and moving pollen around. And they're also very docile bees. So um, they, they don't tend to be aggressive at people. Uh, and it's very easy to construct a, a house for bees uh, that you can keep there in your garden and, and keep them around as pollinators. Uh, sweat bees, another one that you're very likely to run into in the garden. They, they get their name because they're attracted to the salt and water in perspiration. Uh, and they, they tend to be kind of brightly colored. So you, you see these really nice metallic green bees. Uh, sometimes they're yellow, sometimes they're brown, but the ones I always notice tend to have that, that uh, nice green color to them. Uh, and they nest singly in the ground, uh, sometimes in wood, uh, but you can see they, uh, they uh, can uh, get a lot of pollen on them as well. There are a lot of different species of this kind of bee, so a lot of variation that you might notice. Uh, some flowers that work really well for bees, Holly, particularly very early in the year, because holly produces its flowers very early. Uh, yarrow, guara. Uh, I planted guara in my home landscape this year, and it just it had bees and butterflies on it the entire time. Uh, and getting back to our herb garden, uh, basil and rosemary, uh, really attractive plants to bees. Uh, and I mentioned you can construct bee houses, particularly for mason bees <coughs> in your home landscape. And you can see uh, two uh, images here uh, that, that show good examples uh, of the uh, of different kinds of, or different ways of constructing a bee house. Uh, so the, the first image has uh, both methods used. The second image is just one. So one way we can do, we can construct a bee house is just taking cane, uh, drilling it out and assembling it into a frame like that, just setting that in there and the bees will find the size of the cane that they like and colonize. And there are a number of different species that are different sizes and, and prefer different sizes of cane to, uh, to nest in. Uh, the other way that we can make a, uh, a bee house is just taking a, a thick block of wood uh, something like a, a six by six, uh, and just drilling holes into it, different size drill bits, uh, and that provides that same method of uh, of having different sizes of of holes for the bees to occupy. Uh, what I do when I do when when I use that method is I, I take the block and I might cut it down to be uh, a foot long or, or something like that, and I drill all the holes in it. Uh, and then I'll back that with the two by four uh, or two by six that I'm actually gonna put in the ground. And that allows me to then take it back off and drill those holes out after the bees are gone and reuse the same, uh, same uh, block of wood over and over again. Uh, with the cane, you can just take out the cane and throw it away or, uh, or drill uh, the cane back out uh, to kind of clear it out, and make it useful for the bees again. Uh, so those are my comments on uh, beneficial insects for the day. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you're watching on YouTube, if you have any questions, put those down in the comment section. I uh, really appreciate you listening. Uh, and we'll take some time to answer questions uh, here in 